Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the anatomy and functions of the brachial plexus. Now, first of all, what is a plexus? Let's remind ourselves of that. A plexus is a series of nerves that all run together. And when we talk about a plexus, we're talking about the nerves that arise from the ventral rami from the spinal cord. So recall that from the spinal cord, we have nerve roots. The nerve roots converge into a spinal nerve, and the spinal nerve will diverge into a ventral ramus and a dorsal ramus, dorsal being posterior, ventral being anterior. The dorsal rami of at each level of the spinal cord, they're going to serve the structures in the back. So generally muscles that are in the backside, such as the erector spiny muscle group, um, deep muscles that move the spine, and so on and so forth, those are going to be innervated by the dorsal rami. Also the skin in the back will as well. Anywhere we have a plexus, those nerves are going to arise from the ventral rami, from those levels of the spinal cord. And so when we talk about the brachial plexus, these are going to be nerves that arise from the spinal nerve roots of C5 through C8. And then there's going to be a small contribution from the T1 spinal nerve root. Some sources will include the brachial plexus as being C5 to T1. Others will just say C5 to C8, and then there will be contributions from the ventral ramus of T1. So the T1 ventral ramus will contribute to the brachial plexus, but know that the T1 ventral ramus also contributes the first inter intercostal nerve, the T1 intercostal nerve, which runs in the first intercostal space. We talked about this intercostal spaces uh, much earlier on in, in a different playlist. So let's go over here to the left side of this image. We've got C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. These represent the ventral rami pretty much coming directly off of the spinal cord. And as these nerves come off of the spinal cord, some of them, as you can see, are going to converge. I've actually omitted that part of the image. We'll see it on the next slide. But understand that some of these, like C5 and C6, as you can see right here, are going to converge into what we call a trunk. We're actually going to have three different trunks that are going to form. Okay? Now, the one thing I want to mention here is that some of these rami, these ventral rami, which are actually termed roots in the case of the brachial plexus, some of them give off nerves that go to various muscles. The first one we're going to look at comes off of the C5 spinal nerve root, which really means it comes off of the C5 ventral ramus. That's going to be the dorsal scapular nerve shown right here. And because it's directly coming off of C5, we say it only has contributions from the C5 ventral ramus. The dorsal scapular nerve, recall, is going to be innervating the rhomboid muscles, so rhomboid major and rhomboid minor, and then also levator scapulae. The other thing that comes off is this long nerve that really descends inferiorly. This is called the long thoracic nerve. The long thoracic nerve has contributions from, as you can see here, C5, C6, and also C7, so C5 through C7 ventral rami. And the long thoracic nerve is going to be innervating mainly the serratus anterior muscle. Okay. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention here before we go to the next slide is you can see on this image right here, um, this is actually the patient's right ventral rami. Uh, you can see that the ventral rami, those nerves, are coming off of the spinal cord here. And this muscle they're passing anterior to, this is actually the middle scalene muscle. Recall from a different video and a different playlist that the brachial plexus, along with the subclavian artery, actually move between the middle scalenes, which you can see here behind these nerves, and the anterior scalenes, which have been removed. And there's a space between the middle and anterior scalenes called the interscalene space. And you can see here the brachial plexus would be moving in that space anterior to the middle scalene, but posterior to the anterior scalenes, which have been removed. Also, the subclavian artery actually moves through there as well. And you can see here that these nerves of the brachial plexus are going to pass under the clavicle, and that's approximately the region where they're going to start to fuse, as we see right here. So that leads us to the next slide. Notice that C5 and C6, those nerves from each of these corresponding ventral rami, are going to converge. C7 isn't really converging with anything. It stays by itself. And then down here, C8, ventral rami, those nerves are going to converge with that of T1. 
they're going to converge into structures that we call trunks. Okay, so we have a superior trunk, a middle trunk, and an inferior trunk. Okay, so the ventral rami converge into trunks as follows. The superior or upper trunk is composed of nerves coming from C5 and C6. The middle trunk only is from C7. It stays by itself. And then the inferior trunk or lower trunk has contributions from both C8 and T1. Okay? Now, the superior trunk is the only trunk here that has any nerves branching off. Notice the, in the middle trunk and inferior trunk don't have any branches coming off but the superior trunk has two. The first one is the suprascapular nerve. We see that right here. The suprascapular nerve will have contributions from C5 and C6. That's because the superior trunk from which it originates has contributions from C5 and C6. And recall that the suprascapular nerve is going to go into the rotator cuff area and it's going to innervate the supraspinatus and then cross into the infraspinous fossa where it will in innervate the infraspinatus muscle. After the superior trunk gives off the suprascapular nerve, there's another nerve that comes off and runs inferiorly to the subclavius muscle, and this one is just termed nerve to subclavius. And because this one also originates from the superior trunk, it too has contributions from C5 and C6, as I have written here. Okay? So at this point, we've got three trunks, a superior trunk, a middle trunk, and an inferior trunk. The trunks come from the convergence of the nerve roots. And remember, these nerve roots are not nerve roots in the sense that we talk about them in the spinal cord. They really are nerves from ventral rami. Okay? Now these trunks are going to give off divisions. Okay? Now we're into divisions. The trunks give off divisions. So the way to think about this is the anterior division of the superior trunk is going to combine with the anterior division of the middle trunk. Notice that they're both converging with each other right here. And as I'm going to show you in just a second, whenever these divisions combine with each other, they form what's called a chord. And we have three chords. A lateral chord, a posterior chord, and a medial chord. And just so you're aware, these chords are named for their relative orientation to the axillary artery. Okay. So, for example, the posterior cord is directly posterior to the axillary artery. And then the lateral and medial cords are both lateral and medial to the axillary artery. So hopefully that makes sense. Now what we can say here is the lateral cord is composed of the anterior division of the superior trunk and the anterior division of the middle trunk. The posterior cord, you can see here, is composed of the posterior division of the middle trunk and the posterior division of the lower or inferior trunk. Okay? And the medial cord over here is composed of the anterior division of the inferior or lower trunk and that's it. So the medial cord doesn't actually get any contributions, uh, divisions from the middle or superior trunks. Okay? But whenever these divisions combine or converge with each other, they then form these cords lateral cord, posterior cord, and medial cord. So now we have these three cords, lateral cord, posterior cord, and medial cord. Each one of these has at least one nerve that branches off of it. Uh, the bottom two here actually have three, and then the lateral cord only has one. We're going to start by talking about the lateral cord. This cord is going to be lateral to the axillary artery. The only nerve that comes off of the lateral cord is the lateral pectoral nerve. And the lateral pectoral nerve is going to innervate the pectoralis major muscle. Ultimately, the lateral pectoral nerve has roots from C5 to C7. And if we think about it, that makes sense. The lateral cord itself is formed from the anterior contribution from the superior trunk. And remember that the superior trunk is from C5 and C6. And then the lateral cord also receives contributions from the anterior division of the middle trunk. And the middle trunk is from C7. So that's why the lateral cord really itself is C5 through C7. And since the lateral pectoral nerve comes from that, it also bears the same roots. One other thing about the lateral pectoral nerve, it's also going to communicate with the medial pectoral nerve, which comes off of the medial cord. And we'll see that in a couple of minutes.
Next, we have the posterior cord. The posterior cord is really going to have contributions from every single nerve root, or I should say ventral rami, from the brachial plexus, C5 all the way down to C8, and including a little bit of T1. That's because the posterior cord gets posterior contributions from the superior trunk, which is C5 and C6. It gets posterior contributions from the middle trunk, which is C7. And then it gets posterior contributions from the inferior trunk, which is going to be C8 and a little bit of T1. So the posterior cord really has all of those in it. Now the posterior cord is going to give off three nerves. And the order that it gives them off is, first of all, the upper subscapular nerve. The upper subscapular nerve is going to innervate the upper or superior part of the subscapularis muscle. Recall that that's the anterior rotator cuff muscle. The upper subscapular nerve is going to have most of its contribution from C5 and C6, though. The second nerve that comes off is the thoracodorsal nerve. The thoracodorsal nerve is going to innervate the latissimus dorsi muscles and it's going to receive most of its contribution from C6, C7, and C8. The third nerve that's given off from the posterior cord is going to be the lower subscapular nerve. This is going to innervate the inferior or the lower part of the subscapularis muscle, so it's going to complete the innervation that was started by the upper subscapular nerve. And like the upper subscapular nerve, the lower subscapular nerve is going to receive most of its contribution from ventral rami of C5 and C6. Finally, we have the medial cord, which is going to lie medial to the axillary artery. The medial cord is only going to contain contributions from C8 and T1, and that's because the medial cord does not receive any contributions from either the middle trunk or the superior trunk. Notice that it only gives off a contribution. It doesn't actually receive any. So the medial cord is going to have the same original contributions as the inferior trunk, which is C8 and T1. Okay? So, the medial cord, C8 and T1, it's going to give off three nerves itself, like the posterior cord. The first nerve given off by the medial cord is the medial pectoral nerve, which has contributions from the ventral rami of C8 and T1. Now, the medial pectoral nerve also is going to innervate the pectoralis major muscle, just like the lateral pectoral nerve. When I did the video over the pectoralis major muscle, I mentioned that it had dual innervation from the lateral and medial pectoral nerves, and that the medial and lateral here don't necessarily refer to where on the muscle it's innervating, but actually where it comes off of the brachial plexus. Notice the lateral pectoral nerve comes off of the lateral cord, which is lateral to the axillary artery. The medial pectoral nerve comes off of the medial cord, medial to the axillary artery. So it actually refers to where it originates from the brachial plexus. What can happen, however, is the medial pectoral nerve can innervate some parts of the lateral pectoralis major muscle, and conversely, the lateral pectoral nerve can innervate some medial parts of the pectoralis major muscle. Okay? The other two nerves that come off of the medial cord are the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, which gets its roots from T1, and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which is mainly from C8. Now the arm is of course referring to the brachium region, and the forearm is the forearm region proximal to the wrist. And so what these two nerves do is they provide sensory information uh, near the skin, so superficial sensory information on the medial aspects of either the brachium, which is the arm, or the forearm. Okay? These two right here are the only ones up here that provide solely sensory input. These others are going to be providing motor input to all of these muscles. The last thing we're going to talk about are the terminal nerves that are formed from these cords. Okay? Let's begin by looking at the lateral cord. So the lateral cord is going to do two things. One, it's going to continue on as what's called the musculocutaneous nerve, but the lateral cord also gives off a lateral root. Now we usually like to call this a lateral contribution rather than a root because root already refers to the ventral rami from which the brachial plexus originated. So we're going to say here a lateral contribution. So notice the lateral cord gives off a lateral contribution, but it also continues on as the musculocutaneous nerve. Down here on the medial cord, the medial cord will continue on as the ulnar nerve, but it also gives off a medial contribution. Notice that the medial contribution of the medial cord and the lateral contribution of the lateral cord 
converge into what's called the median nerve. Okay, We'll come back to that in just a few minutes. But first, let's talk about the musculocutaneous nerve. This is the continuation of the lateral cord. And so by the same logic that we've talked about before, the musculocutaneous nerve is going to have contributions from ventral rami C5, C6, and C7. The musculocutaneous nerve is going to innervate the anterior arm compartment. So the arm or brachium region has two compartments, anterior and posterior. Posterior is going to be the triceps brachii, and anterior is going to be the biceps brachii, brachialis, and coracobrachialis. Those three muscles are going to be innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. Next, we have the posterior cord. The posterior cord is then going to diverge into two nerves, axillary nerve and radial nerve. The axillary nerve is mainly going to have its contributions from ventral rami C5 and C6, and it's going to innervate the deltoid muscle and teres minor, which is one of the rotator cuff muscles. The other divergence of the posterior cord is going to be the radial nerve. This one's really going to have contributions from the entirety of the brachial plexus ventral rami C5 through T1. And that's because, remember, the posterior cord is formed from the posterior divisions of all three of the trunks, superior trunk, middle trunk, and inferior trunk. The radial nerve is going to innervate the posterior arm compartment. So it's going to mainly hit the triceps brachii, but also the anconeus, or anconeus muscle, which is near the elbow. Uh, this is actually not in the posterior arm compartment, but it's still innervated by the radial nerve. And then once we get to the forearm region, the brachioradialis is also innervated by the radial nerve. At the bottom here, we have the medial cord. The medial cord, remember, is just going to be C8 and T1 because it doesn't receive any divisions from either of those trunks. It is purely going to be from the inferior trunk. So the medial cord will continue on as the ulnar nerve, which of course is still going to be C8 and T1. The ulnar nerve is going to innervate mainly things distal to the elbow. So it's going to innervate the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle in the forearm, and then also a lot of the muscles in the hand itself, not in the forearm, but in the hand, are going to be innervated by the ulnar nerve. We haven't talked about those yet, but just understand there's going to be a bunch in there homologous to what we see in the feet. The last one we're going to talk about is the median nerve. The median nerve is formed from lateral contributions from the lateral cord and medial contributions from the medial cord, and they converge into the median nerve. And so the median nerve is going to have contributions from all of the ventral rami creating the brachial, brachial plexus, C5 to T1. The median nerve is going to be innervating pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus. These are going to be superficial muscles of the forearm and then one of the deeper muscles, the flexor digitorum superficialis. Um, it's not the deepest, but it is deep to these three. And so these are going to be the major muscles innervated by the median nerve. And so all five of these right here, these are going to be terminal nerves of the brachial plexus. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the brachial plexus. It's fairly complicated, but if you take it one region at a time, it becomes fairly manageable. And one of the best ways to actually learn this is to practice drawing it out. And then once you have it drawn out, make sure you can indicate what muscles are innervated by what nerve. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.